It is my great pleasure uh, to introduce two of my favorite philosophers, two of my favorite writers um, in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife in the Department of Philosophy of Michigan State University. He's author of more papers and books than I can conveniently list here, but I would call your attention to his contributions to the debate over wilderness, uh, books included over on the shelf over there, um, and his uh, American Indian Environmental Ethics and Ojibwa Case Study, which he uh, co-did with uh, Baird Calicott. Um, Nelson is also resident philosopher of the Isle Royale Wolf Moose Project, which is the longest continuous study of predator-prey relationships in the world, which means that he spends part of each summer working with animal ecologists on the island. And as I mentioned in an email that I sent to many of you, this really has to be the coolest gig that any philosopher has ever landed in the history of the world. Uh, so I think that's just, I think that's pr pretty remarkable. Um, Kathleen Dean Moore uh, has been here before. Actually, both of our speakers have been here before in the last uh, few years. Uh, Kathy is an essay essayist, philosophy professor, activist, parent. She has many more accomplishments, again, than I could conveniently list. Uh, her books are noteworthy for the beauty of her language and the moral significance of the subject matter, and I have to say, for their depth. Uh, they're absolutely philosophically satisfying. But I have to admit, they often leave me eager to hike farther down the paths that she describes. I'm always left wanting more. Uh, most of all, Kathy's writing is entrancing and funny and moving and engaging, and it will pull you along like a friend calling on the path ahead. Come and see what I found over here. It's just wonderful writing, and I, I ha really have to recommend her, uh, her books to you in the highest terms. Um, in addition to her career as a writer, uh, Kathy Moonlights is a distinguished professor of philosophy and writer laureate at Oregon State University in Corvallis and is author, author of works on justice and mercy, environmental philosophy, and a wide range of other topics. Uh, she's also the founding director of the Spring Creek Project for Ideas, Nature, and the writ Written Word, which seeks to bring together practical wisdom of the environmental sciences, the analytic clarity of philosophy, and the emotional power of the written word to reimagine our relationship to the natural world. I could keep going, but I, I, I won't do this. Uh, so let me, with no further ado, uh, give you Kathleen Dean Moore and Michael Nelson. I was envisioning you on this side. Me too. Well, it's wonderful that you all came out. Thank you. This is a beautiful, beautiful state. We've been uh, driving by wildflowers all day. It's really pretty. And your campus is extraordinary, too. The big mystery, though, is what, who, who are you guys? What are you? Like, I'm the Oregon State University beaver. And Michael? I'm a Spartan. Michael is a, no. Spartan. Spartans. Yeah. You guys are? They didn't all say the same thing. They said cyclones. Oh, OK. That's really cool, because with climate change, you guys are only going to get stronger and more powerful <laughs> in contrast to, say, for example, beavers Ooh. or Trojans who are already extinct. So. And the poor banana slugs. <laughs> it's, uh, it, our subject tonight is uh, moral ground, ethical action for a planet in peril. And we begin by pointing out that, you know, if you were to read the newspapers, you would think that climate disruption and environmental degradation are scientific problems or technological problems with scientific solutions and technological solutions. You would, you would think that they are economic problems, that, that the whole issue about climate change is really opportunities for creating jobs. Our argument is that Climate disruption and environmental degradation are, from the beginning to the end, deeply moral issues. It's problematic, then, that the conversation about our moral obligations in the face of climate change has gone missing. I mean, where are the people who are asking, what are our obligations to the future? What are, what are our obligations to people who don't exist yet? What are our moral responsibilities for people um, on, on other continents or um, in other times and places? Um, maybe those conversations are happening and they're just being drowned out, or maybe they're not happening at all. But our purpose, uh, Michael and I going around to different college campuses and other places, is to try to raise this 
level and the quality of moral discourse about climate change. We're interested in this question. Do we, you and I, have a moral obligation to the future to leave a world as rich in possibilities as the world that was left to us? Um, the, the thing that really strikes us again and again is that this is a moment of choice. It's extraordinary. I wake up and I think, I cannot believe this, that of all the years of human evolution, all these millions and millions of years, it has come down to this, and we're the ones who are alive in this decade, which will be the pivotal point that will pretty much determine the direction of human evolution in the future. So another way to think about this is to think that scientists have provided us with bits of information. I mean, Kathy mentioned that we spend a lot of time talking about the factual elements of, uh, of climate change and other environmental issues, and we spend lots of grant money um, um, in, in the study of, of these issues. So we, you know, we, we know the facts. We understand the facts. Um, and then activists um, have also done very heroic work, kind of urging us uh, to, to act or trying to urge us to act. But to the intense frustration of both scientists and activists, we don't seem to act. And we scratch our heads and we wonder, we wonder why. Um, so one of the, the purposes of this book is to ask that question and maybe offer a different kind of answer. Um, and the answer, if I, I'm a philosophy professor, so I think in syllogisms and I think in arguments. And it's, it's sad and pathetic, and I'm <laughs> seeking therapy yet as we speak, but, but I do. Um, and so think about it this way. Just think about a simple syllogism. Um, the first premise, the factual premise, is the premise that we get from scientists. Um, we are doing certain things to the world that jeopardize the future. Um, the, the conclusion that we often try to muscle in from that one factual premise is that, therefore, we ought not to do that. We ought to do something else. We ought to avert those, that, that calamity. But there's a missing premise, because that conclusion ended with an ought. Um, but there was no ought. There's no ought in the scientific premise. Uh, so there's a missing moral premise. When we started this project, we actually called it the Second Premise Project. And the idea is to fill in that premise. Um, do we actually, as a people, uh, collectively, worldwide, think that we have an obligation to the future to leave a world and it is rich in life and possibilities as the world that was, that was left to us. So one of the ways to think about this book is an attempt to collect the world's moral wisdom and answer that question. I, I've been thinking about it lately as like argument spackle, uh, that we have this big hole in, in our argument and the book's nice and thick um, and we can jam the book this isn't going right. Um, we can jam the book into that, into that hole and we can spackle up the argument. How many of you are scientists or scientists in training? You, you all are our heroes. You are absolutely our heroes. You have done this beautiful, courageous job of helping people understand that climate change is real and it is dangerous and it is upon us. And, um, and, and you must be intensely frustrated that, uh, it, it, that uh, people don't act on the basis of that information. You must just think, you know, if only people knew. If they only knew, then they would act. And so the impulse is to, is to amplify your voices, speak with one voice, learn more things, tell more facts. But the facts alone, as Michael said, aren't going to get us to any kind of course of action, any kind of conclusion about what we ought to do, unless we also have that middle premise that tells us what we value. So the second premise is what we went out around the world to find in this book project. What we did was we, found, we, we identified about 120 of the world's moral leaders. And you know, who are the world's moral leaders? We identified um, the usual suspects, you know, religious leaders, spiritual leaders, politicians, we have one, um, scientists. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough. <laughs> scientists, poets. Who are the people who engage in the work of the second premise? Who are the people who actually explore what our deep values are? Um, philosophers, a couple of those. Couple of them. We told them they had to speak English or they were out. Um, <laughs> a anyway, we wrote them all and we asked them to address that question. We said, please send us a 2,000-word essay, a poem, a prayer, a proclamation, a supplication, a celebration, anything in under 2,000 words that answers that question, do we have a moral obligation to the future? 
we got back responses from every continent except Antarctica. And Michael, you know, we really should have gone after Antarctica. <laughs> that was the thing we really wanted. We would. didn't know anybody who lived in Antarctica. You know, we didn't need to know him. And the answer, of course, was a resounding yes. Yes, we have an obligation to the future. Yes, for the sake of the children. Yes, because justice demands it. Yes, because compassion calls us to it. Yes, for the sake of human survival. On and on from all the corners of the earth came these great yeses. And uh, we put them together into this book that we're calling Moral Ground, organized according to reasons. Um, we're, we're really excited that not a single one of those people asked us for any money. Only one, <laughs> only one respondent asked us for anything, and that was the Vatican. And uh, for, us to <laughs> use <laughs> for us to quote the Pope, they wanted five copies of the book. For the Vatican Library. Yeah. That's oh, all right. That's fair enough. <laughs> He's the Pope. So this is a book project, but it's also, as you can see, it's a larger project than that because we were hoping to use the book then as a, as a basis for continuing conversations. We, I mean, we had a suspicion this was going to work this way, that it, you know, is there a tradition that says that we don't have this kind of obligation to the future? But to really draw out these voices, um, and we, when we deal with moral issues, we tend to focus so much on how much we disagree about things. Um, because the fact that we agree on certain things evidently doesn't seem to be very interesting to people. Uh, but I think in the confines of this particular argument, the fact that we speak with one voice on this, even though we offer different kinds of arguments, uh, is in in incredibly powerful. So one of the things that we're doing, um, so we, we did this book with Trinity University Press, uh, and they're very good at uh, raising funds to promote their projects in, in, in interesting ways. And so we're doing a series of uh, 20, we agree to 20? Suckers. <laughs> uh, 20, 20 town hall meetings around the country. Um, we're here tonight, we're tomorrow night, we're in Madison, Wisconsin, and Georgia next week, and then it gets foggy. Um, and we're conducting these, these town hall conversations um, uh, around, these, around this book. Um, People say, you know, why are you wasting your time with moral conversations? I mean, moral concepts, values, moral principles, moral affirmations, they don't solve problems. They don't turn people's minds. Um, it's, it's money that, that motivates people. You should be talking about money. Or it's power that motivates people. You should be talking to the politicians. But I really beg to differ. When you look at the American history, you will see over and over again that when America turned on a dime and made a huge necessary transformation, it was because of moral principles. It wasn't because of those other factors. You look at the, the moral moxie that, that created the, uh, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, th those are moral principles, and it fueled the revolution. You look at the, uh, at the uh, freeing of the slaves. That was a movement based on ethics. It wasn't about the economics. I mean, if we'd only made economic arguments, we maybe wouldn't have uh, freed slaves. But the point was that we did, and we did because holding people in servitude, denying them humanity, is wrong. Note the moral language. The civil rights movement was based on a dream. The dream was a moral vision of an alternative world, another way we might live, over and over again. Even, even World War II, I think, was in defense of principle, in defense of an abstract notion of freedom and human rights. So, so over and over again, if you, if you see, if you look at those pinch points where things turned very, very quickly, it wasn't because of money, it wasn't because of power, it wasn't because of elections, it was because of people coming together and agreeing that human beings don't act that way to each other. And so what we're trying to create is that same sort of movement by helping, by encouraging, by begging, by challenging people to, to examine their deepest values at a time when our deepest values, what we most deeply cherish, is so completely threatened. One of the things we're trying to do with this town hall meeting, one of the frustrations we have as ethicists is that uh, th these are uncomfortable conversations. When I work with my science colleagues, um, they get a little queasy um, uh, over ethics, and I'm, I don't <laughs> think it's me, uh, but it might be. Uh, but it's, you know, it gets fuzzy. It's a hard conversation to have. And I think w one of the things that, uh, that you know, frustrates me as an ethicist is that somehow um, we've given up that moral voice, given up the, the ability to speak about morality, or it's been taken away from us. But one way or another, we tend to not go there. We tend to not. I mean, there's a reason why that premise is, has gone missing, um, that that's been stolen or given away, and we don't have these conversations. So 
I think one of the things we want to do with these town hall meetings is, is take it back, is, is, is to be able to engage in this kind of conversation. So what we're going to do tonight is not, it's not typical. This is the most lecture um, talk, talk, that, talk. that you'll see. Um, we're going to sort of illustrate the, the contents of the book um, with some, uh, some of the, the writings in the book. We're going to have readings from the book. Uh, Kathy and I are going to read it from our essays, and we have some volunteers to read uh, from other essays of the book, and they illustrate these different kinds of arguments that we saw uh, come in when we, we sort of issued this, this call. Uh, but the other thing we want to do is we want to hear from you. Uh, so we're, we're professors, we can give homework, uh, and we're going to give you homework. You're uh, getting so extra credit for coming, right? Yeah, a lot of you are getting extra credit. I see your notebooks out. Yeah. It's, it's the same universities worldwide. Um, you know, philosophers would have no crowds if it wasn't for extra credit. <laughs> um, so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to charge you with, with questions. We're going to have two sort of series of, of questions because a town hall meeting um, should actually have conversation uh, with the audience. So that's the, that's the kind of landscape for this evening. Yeah. So we'll, we'll start with a series of readings, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, this reading is from Brian Doyle, who is editor of the Portland Magazine at the University of Portland, Oregon, author of nine books and essays of nonfiction and proems. Uh, most recently, Thirsty for Joy, Australian and American Voices, and his papers have appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, Harper's American Scholar, Orion, and the Best American Essays anthologies. So here's, Brian Doyle wrote uh, an essay titled A New Note, N-E-W-T. One time years ago, I was shuffling with my children through the vast, wet, moist, dripping, enormous, thicketed, webbed, muddy, epic forest on the Oregon coast, which is a forest from a million years ago, the forest that hatched the biggest creatures that have ever lived on this bruised, blessed earth. All due respect to California and its redwood trees, but our cedars and firs make them redwoods look like toothpicks. And my kids and I were in a biggest creature mood because we had found slugs way longer than bananas. Footprints of elk that must have been gobbling steroids and a friend had just told us of finding a bear print the size of a dinner plate. And all of us had seen whales in the sea that very morning. And all of us had seen pelicans, too, which looked like flying pup tents. And how do they know how to all hit cruise control at the same time? Does the leader give a hand signal, as my son said? And some of us had seen, too, the two ginormous eagles who lived somewhere in the forest. So when we found the biggest stump in the history of the world, as my daughter called it, we were not exactly surprised. It was basically totally understandable that suddenly there would be a stump so enormous that it was like someone had dropped a dance floor into the forest. And that's the sort of thing that happens in this forest. And my kids, of course, immediately leapt up on it and started shaking their groove fangs and dancing themselves silly. And I was snorting with laughter until one kid, the goofiest, the goofiest, uh, why we did not name this kid Goofy when we had the chance in those first few dewy minutes of life, I will never know. Well, this kid, of course, shimmed over the edge and fell head over tea kettle, vanishing into a mat of fern nearly as tall as me. But for the reason I tell you this story is that while we were all down in the moist velvet of the roots of the ferns trying to be solicitous about Goofy, see if he was busted up anywhere serious, but also trying not to laugh and whisper the word doofus, one of us found a newt. Oh my God, Dad, check it out. And of course the newt rattled at the attention, peed on the kid who held it. And, of course, that led to screeching and hilarity. And, of course, on the way home, we saw damsel flies mating, which also led to screeching and hilarity. But the point of this story is not pee or lust. However excellent a story about pee or lust would be, <laughs> it's that one day when my kids were out there shuffling through the vast, wet, moist forest, we saw so many wonders and miracles that not one of us ever forgot any of the wonders and miracles we saw even though we saw only tiny, tiny shreds and shards of the ones that are there. And what kind of greedy criminal, criminal thug thieves would we be as a people and a species if we didn't spend a, every iota of our cash and creativity to protect and preserve a world in which kids wander about gaping in wonder and hoping that nothing else rubbery and astonishing will pee on them? You know what I mean?
So what I'm going to read to you is a speech uh, that was uh, uh, given at the uh, plenary session of the Rio Summit by a 12-year-old girl from Canada. And uh, this speech appears in uh, Tom Friedman's book, uh, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, Why We Need a Green Revolution and How It Can Renew America. Hello, I'm Severin Suzuki, speaking for ECO, the Environmental Children's Organization. We are a group of 12 and 13 year olds trying to make a difference. Vanessa Suti, Morgan Giesler, Michael, Michelle uh, Quigg, and me, we all raised uh, all of the money to come here 5,000 miles to tell you adults that you must change your ways. Coming up here today, I have no hidden agenda. I am fighting for my future. Losing my future is not like losing an election or a few points on the stock market. I am here to speak for all generations to come. I am here to speak on behalf of the char starving children around the world whose cries go unheard. I'm here to speak for the countless animals dying across the planet because they have nowhere left to go. I'm afraid to go out in the sun now because, the whole, because of the holes in the ozone. I'm afraid to breathe the air because I don't know what chemicals are in it. I used to go fishing in Vancouver, my home, with my dad until just a few years ago when we found the fish were full of cancers. And now we hear of animals and plants going extinct every day, vanishing forever. In my life, I have dreamt of seeing the great herds of wild animals, jungles and rainforests full of birds and butterflies. And now I wonder if they will all, uh, I, and now I wonder if they will even exist for my, ch for my children to see. Did you have to worry about these things when you were my age? All this is happening before our eyes, and yet we act as if we have all the time we want and all the solutions. I'm only a child. I don't have all the solutions. But I want you to realize, neither do you. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up the dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forests that once grew where there now is a desert. If you don't know how to fix it, please stop breaking it. At school, even in kindergarten, you teach us how to behave in the world. You teach us not to fight with others, to work things out, to respect others, to clean up our own messes, not to hurt other creatures, to share, not to be greedy. Then why don't you go out and do the things you tell us to do? Do not forget why you're attending these conferences. You're here, you, you, who, who you're here for, uh, for doing this. We are your own children. We are deciding what kind of world we are growing up in. Parents should be able to comfort their children by saying, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. 